because I've heard how smart you guys are. Constantly, that's all I'm hearing. You guys are like the next generation of like uh, computer programmers, super coders, hackers, whatever. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah. I, know. I see some people nodding. Or you prefer to stay anonymous because hackers like to stay under the radar, right? Yeah. Yeah. You want to you want to keep your options open. White right? hat, gray hat, or black hat. White hat, I hope. You'd be on the side of good, right? Yeah, right. Okay. All right. So I used to be a programmer, just like you guys. As a matter of fact, I learned about computers and software probably about your age. I was in seventh grade. What kind of grade are you guys? Rising seven. Rising seven. Is that kind of the average around here? Yeah. And uh, so what happened to me was. This was back in the old days where a computer would take this whole room. That would be a, considered a small computer. Mm -hmm. A big computer would take the whole floor of this building. And that was all we had. We didn't have PCs. You know, we didn't have like IBM PCs and Apple PCs and cell phones and I, everybody's got an iPad now. Of course. I have, an, I have several Xboxes. Yeah, I mean, you can't live without video games. What do they all run on, by the way? Mm -hmm. Software, yeah. Yeah, software. hardware. Well, there's hardware, yeah, but once the hardware's done, right? You know, IBM yeah. PCs get more powerful every year, but they don't really do new functions, do they? No. Not much. So what really changes all the time is the software. So I think you guys are in exactly the right place. And I'll tell you, I, so the seventh grade for me, try to guess how many years ago that was. Like 45, 46 years ago for me. Three times your age, roughly? <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, I could be your grandfather. Well, think about this though. I learned computer software and I had an amazing career that spanned 40 years. And the software world isn't even done yet, right? There's still tons of things left to do with software. So you guys are picking a very interesting space to be involved in because. If you find this interesting, if you find this fun, there's a lot of really valuable work to be done. What sort of things do we do with software? Just about everything. Yeah. We like process our documents, we add our numbers with it. Software is now starting to drive our cars for us. I think in the next 10 years, we're probably going to have a decent number of like self driving vehicles out there. Like, you know, you'll ride to work in 10 years from now, you guys will have cars. They'll probably be self driving. Right? So you can be like programming on the way to work. That'd be pretty sweet. Oh, wow. Yeah, that'd be neat. And you don't have to pay attention to the road. The car will just do it for you. You could be in a commute and it'd be like no big deal. Of course, then you never know because software is so cool. We might just be working out of our houses watching holograms of our friends and our family and our coworkers right there in the, in the, in the house with us. So we may sit down at the dining room table to have a meeting and... All the people that I need to meet with show up around the table. They look as real to me as you guys look to me. But if I go up and I try to touch them, my hand goes right through them. Oh. Right? I mean, think about the cool world, and it's all software. So, I have 40 years in this. I think there's another 40, 50, maybe 100 years left of software. As a matter of fact, one of the things that I want to tell you about is something that I think is part of the future of software. It's called gene and cell therapy. Gene and cell therapy, what does that have to do with, with software? Well, I'm going to explain that in a minute. But let me just ask you a question. If I told you that you could be involved in software that cures cancer, would you be interested in that? Would that be cool? I think so. That's exactly what we're doing at American Gene Technologies. We're writing software, but it's a different kind of software. It's software that runs on the organic computer that is the human cell. Now, I wouldn't expect you guys to know about this, but I'm going to explain it today so you can understand a little bit about how your bodies work. Who, you, who here knows about genetics? Have you heard of genetics? Okay. Have you heard of DNA? 
Yeah? Okay. Did you know that DNA is like the operating system of the human cell? Yes. You know, your computer has Windows or it has iOS or something like that. But your body, the human cell, the instruction set is coded in what's called DNA. So what's DNA made out of? Genes. Genes are individual commands. Just like in your software, each one of the lines of software has some commands in it, right? And there's a lot of commands in the DNA. And each one of the commands is made up of what? Okay? In your computer, what are the commands made up of? When they when your commands get translated down to the hardware, remember you would want to run hardware, right? Mm -hmm. What's okay, what is the hardware really thinking? What is a command first? What's a command? Action step, action step, an action yeah, step. an instruction, an action step. Mm -hmm. But what is the computer thinking in? Is it thinking in Sometimes. if, this, then, that? Does it know the word then? No. no. What is it translated into? Binary. Binary, exactly. All right, you guys are way ahead of where I thought you guys would be. That's terrific. Okay, it translates it into zeros and ones. Mm -hmm. What makes one command look different to another command on the computer? It's really simple. The order of the zeros and ones, right? Like 110 one, means something different than 101. Mm -hmm. This is how the computer thinks. How does your cell think? Because your DNA is encoded in zeros and ones, is it? What's it coded in? It's like A, T, G. Oh my gosh. This is the smartest middle school group. You guys are middle school, right? Mm -hmm. I think that I've ever talked to. <laughs> that is exactly what it's coded in. The amino acids that are represented by A, C, T, and G. Mm -hmm. So there's four symbols that make up all your genes. And the order of those four symbols is really important. What, if, what would you call a number system that worked with only four symbols instead of, say, two or ten symbols? What's this? It's called base four, right? If you have two symbols, it's base two. If you have four symbols, it's base four. But it's basically just a number. It's a way to represent a number. That's it. So your genes are remarkably similar to the zeros and ones in the computer. The only difference is what the human computer can do versus what the personal computer or your iPhone can do. So what does your personal computer do? I'm going to give you, since I'm talking to my presentation here, we'll see So the, we've talked about this, that the, the personal computer takes zeros and ones and works with them. What is it output? Output what you want the computer to do. Yeah, but guess yep. what? If you went way down into the hardware and you looked at what comes out of the hardware, guess what? the only thing that comes out is zeros and ones. It's called digital. It converts digital to digital, but it does it with intelligence, right? Now, how do we turn digital into, say, this image on the screen here? It's called digital to analog conversion. Because these screens, all the physical things in the world, operate not on zeros and ones, sometimes they operate on electrical impulses and uh, you know, uh, this thing here is actually a series of on, off or color codes that are just in a row here and the computer can go ahead and put together numbers, throw them into a device like that or the screen that I see down here and convert that to an image. What about the camera that I have there on the desk right now? What is it doing? It's doing A to D conversion, analog to digital. So it's taking a picture and it's encoding it in zeros and ones so it can stuff it into a computer and the computer knows how to work with that. So, but in the middle is all the software, right? Where you decide how to process it. Okay, so this is you know, hard to believe in a way, but that's really all that comes out of computers is zeros and ones. Well, that's pretty boring. Yeah, it sure is, except for because of digital to analog and analog to digital computers and stuff. We can work with video signals. We can move robotic arms. We can turn the steering wheel of our car. We can sense the temperature in this room and turn on the air conditioning. We can do anything. 
So the reality is, is that computers, even just working in zeros and ones, can reach out into our physical world and do almost anything because we can build equipment that allows the computers to do that by just putting out the right series of zeros and ones. Okay. Let's talk about the human cell. How's it different? Looks different for one, right? <laughs> and remember, we talked about it works in ACTG, right? That's the command. But what does it output? ACTG. No, cells. good guess though. It puts out enzymes and proteins. It's a really remarkable computer. If you put a command in there that says make insulin or make stomach acid. Or make glucose. Glucose, make glucose, yes. Guess what happens? The cell can convert that command into outputting glucose. That's kind of remarkable in a way, right? It's so remarkable that there's a command in this computer that says, make a copy of me. It can actually take that cell and go and split it into two cells because what's a cell made of? Enzymes and proteins. So literally, this is working in the material it's made of. So this is very much like a computer, but almost more functionality. How do these computers talk to each other? How does this computer talk to another computer? zeros and ones over a satellite signal or over a Wi-Fi signal or over a wire or whatever. How do these ones talk? They also use electrical signals called nerves, but they also know how to signal with chemicals. They'll secrete a chemical that means something to another cell. What else can they do? They can actually bump up against each other and send physical signals. They have a command set and a way of communicating with each other that makes our digital computers look pretty antiquated. Not that amazing. Amazing? Actually, not that amazing. Wow, it makes computers look stupid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, you know, easy with that word stupid. It's still pretty good, but yeah. It, they're not as sophisticated as you. I mean, really, what is more sophisticated? Your body or this computer? We knew it all along, didn't we? Your body's way more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. The new thing is, is now we understand that, wow, you have some things in common with the computer. As a matter of fact, what you are, as I look out at you guys, each one of you is trillions of collaborating organic computers, talking with each other and carrying out all their individual functions to make you, to move your arm, to give your thoughts, to even give yourself consciousness. Well, that, well, yeah, that's your brain. That's your brain. Your brain is what? Cells. cells. There are special cells that have special functions that can rearrange themselves into memories and thoughts and things like that. It's just amazing. It's so amazing. This is like a computer that nobody gave us the manual to. This computer, we can get books that tell us how to program that because this was created by man, right? This one is natural. This one's natural and it evolved with such complexity. And there's no documentation that came with this computer. I wasn't born with a manual next to me. They didn't deliver me like, slap, okay, well, here's the manual. Okay, let's see how we work this one. All right, okay. No, that's not how it works, right? Okay. So, but what it means is that we're gradually discovering everything that this can do and how it talks to the other cells in your body to do everything. We're starting to learn how your immune system fights viruses. Did you know your immune system fights cancer? Yeah. No. You knew that already? You knew oh, that? Why, are, why aren't you guys teaching yes, me no. this class? Oh, you guys okay. seem to know everything already. You got Actually, someone applied for cancer control, so maybe just let me just eating it and like helping grow. That is very advanced. Yes, you're right. And it's, that's good knowledge to have. So, and, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it. But kudos to you guys that. You're not just computer programmers, you're curious people who are picking up all sorts of information. And I actually think that that is absolutely critical to doing really cool stuff, really valuable stuff in life. It's to have curiosity. At our company, we have a lot of curiosity about this, so we read everything about how everything works. And what we think about is we've got a new capability where we can change your DNA. Remember, your DNA is the command set for every single cell in your body. Your DNA is the same in each cell, but the cells are different. Why is that? 
viruses? Well, we're going to talk about viruses, but first I'm going to talk about the cell. So here's a cell, and I'm going to really simplify this. Imagine it looks like a basketball, but it's way smaller, obviously. Right? What's inside the cell? What's in the middle of the nucleus. cell? The nucleus, exactly. What's in the nucleus? The DNA. There's also something called a manager. So what I like to think of the nucleus as is the manager's office. Okay, the manager is what's called the endogenous promoter. That's technical, but basically, there's something in there, and this is what allows every one of your cells to be different. The manager knows what part of the DNA to run, right? Your computer's full of software, and you decide which part of it runs. It's not running all the software simultaneously. My computer's not doing the same thing as your computer, or your computer, or your computer, right? Right. So the operating system can have a ton of stuff in it, and then you, as the manager of the computer, can decide what gets run. That's what this guy's function is too. He looks at the DNA and he knows which of the commands pertain to this cell. Am I a stomach cell? Am I supposed to be creating stomach acid? What about if I'm a retinal cell? I should be making light-sensitive proteins that convert light into electricity that gets sent to my brain. What if I'm a skin cell? I should be replicating because skin tends to flake off over time, so your skin is replacing itself, right? What if I'm a muscle cell? I take electrical impulses and when I see those, I move, all right? So there's no A to D conversion in your body. It's basically the cells are the machinery and they can go across these you know, vast number of commands. The manager decides what commands for each cell. What's, the, what's this part called? Do you remember that name? It's called the cytoplasm. Oh. Okay, there's no reason you should know that at your age but you might become curious about it one day. But for the time being, think of the cytoplasm as the shop floor, right? This cell is like a little factory. Here's where they make stuff, and here's where they decide what they make, right? And how do they decide what they make? They have a copy of the DNA, and the manager looks at the DNA every day, and he says, which part of this DNA needs to be executed? And he sends out things called messenger RNA, little copies of commands. RNA are like half DNA. Half DNA. Wow, you guys are pretty advanced. He sends out those messages, and the machinists pick up the messages, and they do whatever those messages say. You. What? This here, that could be considered messenger RNA. That? Don't worry about that. It came in a little early before no, I started talking about it. There we go. It's gone now. Yeah. So it's kind of a software hardware relationship? Yeah. It's like your cell is, it's got software that's built out of hardware and hardware that's built out of software almost. I mean, it, yeah, it's like this hybrid thing. But it does work a lot like software, remember, because this DNA has specific commands that will be executed by the machinery. What do viruses do? They go and make your computer very bad and They, that's right. They do the same thing in cells as they do in computers. And that is, they come along, they somehow get attached to the computer, and then they dump in their own software. Right? Mm -hmm. What does their software normally say? Replicate viruses. Replicate viruses, exactly. That would be normal software. Now, the cell has never made a virus before, but if you give it the right commands, guess what? It can copy viruses even. That is an amazing thing. So it converts it all the viruses. And it explodes. And it explodes. It actually technically kind of implodes. You know why? The, these machines start using so much of all of the materials around the factory to make viruses. They're running out. Remember that the cell is made out of materials. They start borrowing from the walls, the manager's office, everything. They start dissolving everything. and the cell just melts away and the viruses escape. And what do they do? And they continue. Yeah. And because you have an immune system, the viruses get stopped. Stopped dead in their tracks. Because while they're multiplying, your immune system detects them and it multiplies killer cells and antibodies and things like that even faster. Mm -hmm. And that's why you get a cold, you maybe you feel sick for a couple of days, then you start feeling a little better and then you're all better like a week later. Mm -hmm. That's because your immune system is so powerful. Mm -hmm. All right. Now that is a normal virus. I like to call that a smash and grab virus. Why? Because it's sort of like, it just destroys the factory when it goes in there. So if you get a cold virus in a cell, that, that cell is gonna die, and it's gonna die quickly. 
It also makes it very easy for your immune system to detect because there's like millions of copies of the virus all over, right? So, this is a sneaky virus. I like to call it the 007 super spy virus. And what's that virus? Well, it's, there's a whole class of viruses, but one of them is called HIV. Oh, Who's yeah. heard of HIV? Yeah, really? scary, huh? It destroys the immune system. It destroys the immune system. You know how it destroys it? The it's same really way. clever. No, it does it in a slightly different way, actually. Oh. Yeah, it's more clever. Because instead of just dropping commands in here, remember it just flooded, the last virus just flooded the shop floor with a bunch of commands that said make copies of me? Mm -hmm. The super spy HIV virus actually sneaks across the shop floor, breaks into the manager's office, mm -hmm. picks the lock on the DNA safe, and inserts new commands. Oh wow. It oh. changes the DNA permanently in the cell. You know this cell? can live for like another 10 years in your body, slowly making making HIV virons that can go on and, and uh, infect other cells. Mm -hmm. And your immune system doesn't detect it because it's so stealthy. Mm -hmm. It can sneak around. It actually looks, this looks a lot like food in your bloodstream. So that's one way that it uses to camouflage itself. But the fact that it's creating things very slowly and not blowing up cells, it takes over the immune system over many years. Sometimes it takes as long as a decade for people to know that they're infected with HIV. Mm. Now, before I scare you, okay, <laughs> uh, I've got some good news for you, is that HIV um, is getting very well understood, and in fact, we at American Gene Technologies are working on a cure for HIV. So people now take medicine every day if they have HIV so that they don't, their immune system doesn't get destroyed, mm -hmm. but that's very, you won't want to take that medicine, So you will want to avoid HIV. It's not like getting a cold, it's more mm -hmm. serious than that. Mm -hmm. But that medicine is, makes you feel really sick. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes you feel a little nauseous every day, a little headachey. It's better, you know, for people not to have to take those meds. Well, the good news is, is that we found a genetic way to go in and cure HIV. I'm not gonna have time to go into that because I promised you to talk about cancer. HIV. Yeah. Okay. So once HIV is in there, you see the cell turns out all its normal stuff. But then every once in a while, it turns out something else that's related to the HIV. And that little command there might just birth one viron. And it floats away, the cell was never even destroyed. So it actually went in there and rewrote the operating system of the organic computer. It put new commands in there. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can put new bad commands in there, what else could you do? Exactly. We have a way now to convert viruses into updates, right? Oh, wow. Updates aren't bad for your computer. So what we do is we take I HIV. I we do this in the lab all the time. We take HIV and we crack it open and we scoop out the HIV genes that cause AIDS. We scoop them out and we throw them away. What's left? Not nothing. Kind of nothing, but the delivery capability is still there. It's like a, it's like an empty diskette that can bring software to the organic computer. So what do we put inside of it? Good genes. That's you guys all knew that. So we can add genes, and the other thing that we can do is we can add little genetic constructs called interrupting RNA that shut off genes. So we have the ability to either add a gene or get rid of a gene. Then we just go ahead and bolt it back together again, make copies of it, and we just make enough pills to infect all the cells we want to infect, put it into your body, and we can change your DNA. And we can do really clever things with that. The other thing we have, so I'm going to show you how we cure HIV. So you've got, uh, you know, this is the normal cell, and maybe it's got HIV in it. Well, we go ahead and we take HIV, one, we're adding a gene and we're getting rid of a gene. The gene that we add could go ahead and make a new protein or an enzyme, mm -hmm. but the gene, that little X, will actually attach to the gene genetic information from the HIV gene and kill it, shuts it off. Ooh, yeah, know. so that's how, sort of a clue to how we cure HIV. And here's the last thing I want to tell you about the software in here. It's very unsophisticated, but it has one thing that 
expands the capability beyond just turning on a gene or turning off a gene. It's got an if-then state. Which is what? What is that? What's in it? Oh, if else, but also if then can apply. What is that? Conditional code. Okay. Conditional code. So what we can do is call it, it's called a specific promoter. But every piece of software we deliver into your DNA, we can attach a little conditional statement to it that says, if you see this enzyme or protein, then turn this on. But otherwise, don't turn this on. So what does that do? Well, well, we can go ahead and use that to decide what tissue we're in. We can look for an enzyme that's characteristic of, say, liver. So we know that this virus will only turn on in the liver. Or we can even look for something that's characteristic of a disease, like a cancer. And we can say, oh, if it's making this enzyme, it's a cancerous cell. You know there are genetic tests now that tell you whether a cell is cancerous, right? Well, we can actually use that genetic information to turn on a drug that will only turn on in the cancer. Smart fuse. Smart fuse, yeah, exactly. So we can throw a bomb into the cancer Smart cell, bomb. but what if the bomb misses the cancer cell and goes into a healthy cell? It won't turn on. Oh. Mm. You get it? So now we can make what are called targeted Target. drugs. And most of the side effects in drugs that you know make drugs not usable actually come from what's called off-target effect. Because they land where they're not supposed to be, and then they turn on where they're not supposed to turn on, and it makes you sick. Mm -hmm. How does a pill, when you take an aspirin, how does it know where to go in your body? It doesn't. It just goes everywhere, you see? And it guesses where, where Yeah, it just treats every cell the same way. Mm -hmm. It's an equal opportunity drug, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But if you take a genetic drug, it may go all over your body, but only turn on where it's needed, right? That means we can make drugs that are more powerful, even drugs that kill cancer. So let me show you the clever way that AGT is starting to cure cancer. And we think that this product should come out, be hey, tested in humans. Yeah, these are actually mice, but yes, rodents. And uh, they're modified. They look like rats because they're hairless, and that's just because they've been genetically altered to be more, uh, e to be easier for experimentation. So we can see things easily on their skin. And you can see this mouse has liver cancer. He's actually got human liver cancer that we put into him. And it's not killing him because it's not growing in his liver. Right? It's growing on his back. But we can use that as a way to test drugs that treat liver cancer. That's called a xenograft model. We take a cancer from humans, stick it into a mouse where it doesn't hurt him really because it's growing on his back. It's not convenient. He probably doesn't feel really comfortable. And look at how skinny he is. You know why that is? Because the cancer is growing so fast, it's taking all his food from him. He eats all day long, and the cancer is like, hey, thanks for the food. And then he's like, hey, what about for my muscles? You know, like, no food left for you. That's why he got so skinny. This guy got treated with a virus, and look at him. He looks fine. And that's the power of gene and cell therapy. And that's the sort of thing that can be done with this new class of software in organic computers. So here's the little tricky thing we're doing, because it all boils down to creativity. The exact same thing that you guys have to think about when you're writing software is, how do I put together a limited set of tools, statements and things like that, to do something useful? That's exactly what we think about at AGT. So here's what we thought about. We looked at cancer and we said, okay, cancer grows up, and remember, was it you who was saying that it can camouflage itself? You're absolutely right. Turns out that in your body you have T cells that are always looking for cancer. But if enough cancer, if cancer grows big enough, it actually starts putting camouflage on its surface so that your immune system won't see it as well. But those cells are out there that are looking for cancer and they actually keep you cancer free your whole life long. You know, you don't really get into sort of the danger zone until you're like in your 60s or 70s where you've been living long enough that maybe enough chemicals that have crept into your body or air pollution or radiation that's outside or whatever, you know, too much occurrences of malignancies, little teeny cancers, mm -hmm. and your immune system over time gets a little bit lower, and so something might escape and start growing. Now it's blowing like, up like a balloon because the cancer multiplies very fast. What does the outside of the balloon look like? It's growing big fast. Too much pops. surface area. If, yeah, it actually does send out, it doesn't really pop, but because it's solid. 
It's not actually air inside something. It's actually cells that are growing up yeah. into like a bowling ball. It's more like a bowling ball than, oh. a, than a balloon, <laughs> right? And it might put some camouflage on the outside, but your cells are still out there looking for it. It's just they're not successful at it. So here's what we do. We go ahead and we have a, a viral, viral vector, a virus, viral particles that we made out of HIV that carry a gene that causes a percentage of the tumor to secrete a small molecule, in other words, a little enzyme or a little protein. And what it is, is it's something that acts like perfume to your immune system. And all of the cells that normally look for cancers are like, what's that smell? That's nice. Mm -hmm. I think I'll go over and see what that is. And they all show up here. All right, so now we're attracting more of these cells. The other thing that happens is when they get close to the perfume, they get excited. So they, they're really attracted to the cancer now, and they go into a hunt and kill mode. And in that hunt and kill mode, they can eat cancer at 300 to 600 times faster than normal. Whoa. Whoa. So what does that do to this tumor? What do you think happens? Now it explodes. Boom. Nothing. These T cells that came in and got activated turned around and ate the cancer away totally. And also the, the LV immunotoxin. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Because those cells, remember, that were had the modification on, they also get killed. Which means that afterwards all the software is gone because it's safe. It's not to leave any software lying around yeah. in your body that you don't need. It's kind of like antivirus. Yeah. What else happens? These T cells are circulating all around your body. So what else? Have you heard of metastases? Mm -hmm. That's when the cancer starts sending out little babies around your body. Yeah. So well, since these things are circulating all over your body, they ca capture the babies or any secondary tumors that are starting to grow. So think about that. You know how we treat cancer today? Surgery, mm -hmm. radiation, mm -hmm. and chemotherapy. Yeah. Surgery is cut it out. Radiation is burn it out. Mm -hmm. With ironically, Radiation also causes cancer, but they have clever ways to do it so you don't get much cancer anywhere except for where they're trying to burn. And what's chemotherapy? Mild poison. The idea is to put a poison in your body that the cancer cells uptake a little faster, and you poison this person enough to kill the cancer, but not enough to kill them. So that they recover and feel okay a few weeks later, and the cancer doesn't recover. I know it sounds crazy. But with this, we might be able to reduce it to just a shot. Mm -hmm. This is very exciting. And this is all software. All it is is a little piece of genetic information that we stick into cells to get them to create something new. And because of our understanding of the body, of cancer and the immune system, we're able to turn that into something where in a thousand mice, sorry for the gross picture, 85% <laughs> of the mice come back 100% cancer free. Mm -hmm. Think about that, with one shot. And we think this will work in humans. And over the next couple of years, we're gonna to try to develop that. Mm -hmm. Now our cure for HIV that I was mentioning to you, we think we're gonna go into human studies this year. How exciting would that be, mm -hmm. right? Thank goodness nobody in here has HIV or has to deal with that, mm -hmm. but there's a million fellow Americans that have to deal with it every day. And, and we might be able to cure them. them, it's a big deal. Yeah. So we're very excited about that, This you don't need to know. This is how we cure HIV. This is our team. That's about IP. And that's the end. All right? Good job. I certainly can stay. I just don't want to wreck your schedule. All right. Uh, hi, sir. How are we doing today? Uh, we also have another guest presenter. Do you have time? Sure. Yeah? All right. So we can open the floor for some questions, both from adults as well as students. Uh, so what are the questions? Some questions that we have. Or maybe I should ask first, uh, what does Jeff do? Tell me a little bit about what Jeff does. Oh, okay. Uh, we're, we're starting so I, somewhere. I'm what's called the CEO of American Gene Technologies. That stands for Chief Executive Officer. It's like the That's president, like president of the company. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's exciting. That's so awesome. My background is really software. But I have a whole bunch of people on my team that are well, biologists, immunologists, virologists, 
scientific uh, researchers, uh, you know, all these people who actually help me and help each other and make these drugs. Yeah, awesome. All right, so do we have questions? I have a question. Can I start at least? Uh, so when you were around their age, right, mm -hmm. and I know you said you started in technology, did you ever think about the direction that you were going to take? Did you have an idea of a seed you wanted to plant in the community in which it branches out like this? Were you thinking about, you know, medicine at all? Where, what was the path almost that you took to be in the space that you are in? So it's a little bit more relatable to middle school. Sure. So what happened to me was that when I saw computers for the first time and I learned how to program and I saw what they could do, I got very excited about, I could see a lot of different ways in which computers could create value for humans, mm -hmm. right? They could get rid of a lot of the boring jobs in life, all the things that, you know, just I hated doing, right? Because you write the recipe once, you write the software once, and it bakes the cake, it runs the program exactly the same every time. Now you may have to go in and debug it or whatever, but Computers are great at repeating stuff. Yeah. And once you program them right, they generally don't make mistakes because they're what's called deterministic. They execute exactly what you put in. And so I got really excited because I saw that a lot of the things that I hated doing would be eliminated by computers. And that, I would say, was my birth as a technologist, right? Because I thought I was a computer programmer, but I wasn't. I wasn't in love with software. I was in love with what software could do, mm. right? And so that just attracted me for a long time, and that's why I said to you, like, if you're interested in software, there's still another hundred years of software to be written, at least. So you guys will be, you know, retired and whatever, have, having had really great careers. So you know, I, I was so in love with software at your age that at age 15, I started teaching a class on, on weekends at MIT. Have you guys heard of MIT? Well, Massachusetts mm -hmm. Institute of Technology? Yeah. So my dad went there, so I knew how to get there. Now you guys could teach classes at colleges too, right? They need teachers. They don't care who does teach it. If you're good at, say, programming in a particular language, you know, maybe you could assist a class here, and then maybe eventually you teach a class here. You never know, right? But in my case, I was wandering around MIT trying to get free computers to use, right? Because back then, computers took this whole room. So, you know, basically I had a teletype that was like a remote terminal that went over the phone line to a computer that took a room this size. But at MIT, they had rooms this size all over campus with computers in them that weren't even being used probably most of the time. Well, yeah, yeah. they're not even allowed to touch them. Well, they, they're allowed to touch them, it's just that there's more computers than they need. Yeah. So, you know, people would have these labs with these fabulous computers you know, sort of the iPads of back then, but nobody had them, right? Yeah. And they let me into the labs, like, I'm not using the computer, sure, you can use it. And wandering around the campus, they uh, asked me if I wanted to take a class, and they didn't have any computer classes, so I asked them if I could teach one, and they said yes. So that's how I got into teaching. So I went out to Silicon Valley after that. Well, actually, I went to college, and I taught through college also. And then I got recruited into Silicon Valley as a programmer, and that's when I first discovered that programming was what excited me. Because I'd done so much of it at that point, I'd solved all the puzzles. It didn't challenge me as much anymore. So I moved into sales, marketing, business, things like that, but pertaining to computers. And I had a really good career in Silicon Valley, and I retired when I was age 41. I had enough money that I didn't have to work anymore. So I tried that for five years, and then guess what happened? I got bored. Because it's not as exciting when you're, maybe when you're 70 or 80 years old and you're retired, it's great. You're, you're happy just sitting around reading books or, or whatever. But no, I, I, I want more. I still wanted challenges. And so I thought I would just dabble in technology. And then I met somebody at National Institutes of Health here in Maryland. So I was living in California, but I met a guy here and he showed me viral vectors and my head practically exploded. It was like the first day when I met computers when I realized, oh, this can do a lot of great stuff, I just said to him, hey, this is the software industry for the next 100 years, reprogramming the human computer for better health. What can we do with that? Anything. Did you know that there's already a gene therapy out there that cures blindness? Not every type of blindness, but there's a type of blindness where people were blind, 
They gave them gene therapy. It restored a gene that was missing in their eyes, and their vision came back. Is that a miracle? Yes. But I knew that day one. I was sent to Roscoe Brady. I said, this is going to make blind people see, make crippled people get out of their wheelchairs and walk. This is going to, you know, cure cancer. And guess what? 12 years later, it's doing that. So there's one cure for blindness. There's two cancers out there that were completely deadly. If you had that cancer, the doctor would say to you, sorry, there's nothing we can do. You're going to die. Now they say to you, hey, we got this cure. You want it? <laughs> and they're, you're like, yeah, I'll take it. So that's how I, I got into this work is that I'm excited by technology. I love people, right? Everybody who has a body has an interest in gene and cell therapy, right? Because gene and cell therapy is gonna turn out software that's gonna make them healthier and better. We don't even have to stop once we cure all the diseases in the world. What can we do next? Yeah, we can make you smarter, stronger, live longer, look better. Who knows? Okay, that would be a long ways away. But I'm just saying that we're never going to run out of things to do here, just like you're never going to run out of things to do with these computers. All right? So thank you very much. Thank you. Can we have a round of hands?